Um, Nancy, thank you so much for that introduction. It's good to be with you this morning. You know, um, when Vlad Nook, one of the worship guys, first saw the title of the sermon, Where Peace and Catapults Meet, he said, who catapults anymore? Um, to, to, which, to which I answer, let us go into our passage today. <laughs> From scripture, uh, the gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. This is the parable of the persistent widow. So I'll read this out, and then we will dive right into our sermon. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him. With the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his own chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they will get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, one of the interesting things about the way this parable is written is it's actually introduced by the author of the gospel as this is a parable about prayer. Um, Not much in the parable suggests that it's about prayer, but the author seems to understand that this parable is about prayer, and that introduces us into that. Now, when we're discussing the the spiritual life of a congregation, and particularly prayer, things can become very um, awkward and uncomfortable the analogy that I'd like to make is it's almost like if a married couple were going to see a counselor and they started to having to talk about their sex lives to this counselor. It doesn't seem exactly right. This person's not involved, nor should they be involved in this aspect of our lives. Um, and all sorts of very awkward things that, that, that come up. And yet it, it's sort of necessary if we're really going to get to, to, to the heart of the relationship at hand, and especially prayer, which is uh, the most intimate and exclusive relationship that we have between ourselves and our Creator. And when we feel that someone else is, uh, at least I do, when, when someone else is coming to talk about it or we, we get into community prayer, I almost feel a little bit of an invasion upon that space uh, where we don't feel that we can be as honest and vulnerable as, uh, as we would like with him who, uh, a wonderful hymn says, has seen the depths of our hearts and so loves us the same. Yet, as Kingsway is going through this time of transition and soul-searching, and as someone as myself that has seen this congregation over the years and served it and loved it, I, I can't help but feel that if I can be a blessing in some manner in, in instructing you about this th- aspect of the spiritual life that it is my uh, joy to do so. Now, having spent the past year in Scotland, I'm tempted just to share with you everything about my trip and pretend that that was a sermon. Um, you know, there was, there was much that's been going on in my own uh, heart and mind over the past years, but in the spirit of a prayer that I have uh, was reminded of, the Franciscan prayer, me and my flatmate, Ryan DeMarco, uh, got to visit Assisi back in May, and uh, the, the prayer that I was reminded of, some of the lines in it are, O oh Master, grant that I may desire rather to console than to be consoled, to understand rather than to be understood, to love rather than to be loved. These are um, some of the most important words in my own prayer life. And that, yes, if you are wondering, is a picture of a CC. And uh, if you're like my mother, you're wondering why I ever came back. Um, <laughs> but, but it is in the spirit of this prayer that I, I hope to 
console you, to understand you, and to love you, into being galvanized, into being catapulted, into being the kind of congregation and continuing to be the congregation that God wishes to see in the world. Now, before I dive right into the passage, um, I've noticed that some aspects of church services, you know, there's always an exchange of two people. So worship, the worship band sings, the people sing, offering, they hand out the plates, you put in the money, prayer, people pray with the person that's praying. But the sermons, the one aspect where it's just one person and you are... Uh, so wonderfully attentive to every word that, that comes about. And um, I, I, w- I would actually encourage you to participate in this sermon through a refrain. There's going to be a refrain that I'm going to use throughout this sermon in imitation of the widow. And the refrain is simply, knock, knock, knock. So now one time I'm going to say it, and you repeat with me. And if you'd like, throughout the sermon, when that comes up, I want you to feel free to recite that refrain with me so that you feel that you are a part of the sermon and this content. So just one time before I go right into it. Knock, knock, knock. Beautiful. (laughs) And that is an important question that we will see. Now, the Gospel of Luke, where our our parable is found, it appears to have been written for uh, non-Jewish Christians sometime after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE by the Roman emperor's son, Titus, who sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the Second Temple. This is the Arch of Titus that uh, is, is in Rome, and you can see depicted them carrying the menorah and other temple implements out uh, as they destroyed the temple. And so our gospel is composed shortly after, or maybe about a decade after, this very important event. And so what begins to happen is that the center stage of the scriptures are no longer Jewish Christians with other Jewish people, but it's actually gone to a wider Greco-Roman audience. You know, Paul has done his journey as far as he can, and the, the audience is no longer primarily centered around the temple. And so what begins to happen is that much of Jesus' teaching takes on new but inspired meanings that the parable, when he said them to his original audience, might not originally have had, and yet they're still inspired meanings. So let me give you a quick summary of what the context before and after our parable would have sounded like to its first listeners, and then try to explain where the transition has has appeared. The Pharisees asked when the kingdom of God would come. When would Roman occupation of their God-given homeland end? And when would Yahweh restore the Davidic king on the throne? And Jesus replies, Don't think you'll be able to observe the kingdom coming in any particular place. The kingdom of God is already in your midst, and you fail to recognize it. No, the Davidic king, the son of man, must first be rejected by this generation. But when the son of man returns in judgment upon the city that rejected him, it shall be as the days of Noah and of Sodom and Gomorrah. There will be warning and all kinds of birth pangs, but people will not take heed, but continue to bother about their business, and it will come upon them suddenly. One will be standing and the other left, so that they will know neither where nor when the kingdom of God comes. Where shall they be taken, Lord? The disciples asked. And he said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. This is a Roman Aquila. This is the standard bearers that they use for their armies. And many, they depict many animals on them, but the most common is the eagle. And so many scholars think when Jesus says, where the vultures will gather, he's poking a little fun at this Roman symbol of the eagle. Then the disciples asked, Lord, what about the elect? What about your people? And he told them our parable in an encouragement not to lose heart. The elect at that time were like the widow resourceless. She has no father or husband upon whom to depend to bring her case to court, which is the kind of person that you would have needed in that time and space to bring your case to court. She is the most shamed in society with no options left. Beating the judge black and blue is the literal Greek. It's near harassment um, for her justice. To a representative of a society 
where the courts and judges care neither for the common man nor have any fear of God, for they represent the society that believes it has taken God's throne in the world. Totally unlike the world we live in. (sighs) The only language the judge speaks is money, but because of the widow's undying badgering, she wins her case if only because the judge is annoyed with her. And so even if the most corrupt of judges will deliver justice to those who continually and unceasingly beg for it, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Knock, knock, knock. So the only question concerning the kingdom of God that the elect need care about is neither where nor when, but that when it comes, will we have been prepared with the faith, not that the arc of the universe will bend passively towards justice, that it will just happen, but that the architect of the universe will bring justice when every knee will bend. And no one is exempt from this justice. God doesn't show any partiality. And so for the first listeners to this parable, it both consoled them that despite all appearances, the kingdom of God was being brought about, and yet at the same time actively encouraged them to be participating, to be catapulted into what God is doing in the world and to bring that cry of justice to their own lips. Even if it be against the proud Pharisees in the Jerusalem temple establishment in the coming of the vultures of the Roman Empire upon the whitewashed tombs of those who failed to recognize their Messiah, Now, what begins to happen after this important event in 70, the destruction of the second temple, is that this meaning of the parable gets transferred so that the Christians begin to look upon this passage and they see it in a wider context of not just the Son of Man um, bringing judgment upon Jerusalem, but upon Uh, all powers that have rejected him and have persecuted his people, and this would be the Roman world that would be next. They understood that while kingdom had come, there was still work to be done and a spiritual struggle still to be fought. And their cries can be heard in the book of Revelation in particular, which is what I did my master's thesis on. But in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Likewise, a similar cry can be heard even as far back as the the Jewish people in their first exile in Babylon, in a very harsh and dark passage. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy are those who repay you according to what you have done to us. Happy are those who seize your infants and dash them against the rocks. There's a passage you don't hear in church very often. Uh, and why, why have I brought such passages before you, such terrifying things? Um, should I not be telling you how to make requests in prayer about how you feel solace and peace and contemplativeness and different methods of prayer and positions and all, all that sort? Um, and there's a time and place for all of that, and I'm sure that you will be taught by those much more qualified than I to speak to those matters of bringing peace of mind to prayer. But for the type of prayer found in our parable, I found it discussed only once. I went through 13 books, and there was a footnote on Luke 18. That was it. Um, And so I felt it necessary to try to explain to a congregation whose demographic may not be... um, used to, or maybe you are, but I I suspect that, like myself, you're not used to hearing such things in prayer. And to help you understand maybe a little bit more controversially, since this stuff focuses on justice, why there are segments of our society that are not happy with the way the world is arranged, and in particular, our position within it, and why that itself is... Christian. Now, one of the future difficulties and why I drew upon this passage is I would argue that for any congregation in North America, one of the 
big struggles that's going to continue to happen is there's going to be this push and pull between those who go to church for solace and consolation during times of grief and to help them cope with life. And goodness knows we've all been there. And I don't mock that in the least, and we all need that. And then those that don't want to cope with life, they they want their faith to be able to transform the life that they see around them. Um, Not something to merely get them through and be at peace, but something that would actually agitate them and and awaken them to, to try and bring God's kingdom on earth. And it's going to be the difficulty of trying to keep these two sort of mindsets together. And this kind of prayer that we find in Luke 18 is what I'm going to call petitionary prayer. And petitionary prayer, I already does two things. One, it, it not only catapults us or galvanizes us into participating in, in what God is doing in the world and wanting to transform the world, but it brings some measure of solidness, of solace and clarity by defining what our role is in the world and what it isn't. In the world, and so I'm hoping to illuminate how this type of prayer can can actually ha- help sort of both those mindsets that we all find ourselves going in and out of. Now, the prayer in Luke 18 is not contemplative; it's not uh, breath prayer; it's not asking for forgiveness; it's petitionary prayer. And I would actually argue that most of the world knows what petitionary prayer is. Just most of the time it goes by other names. And often if you get into, you know, rationally minded people's discussions about prayer, they, they will ask uh, this question about prayer, you know, how can saying words in an abyss to someone you hope is there um, affect the world in any way? Would it not be better to send money to help rather than pray for some area of the world? What What is it that it effectively does? Is it something that just... Um, affects your own psychology? Are you talking just to yourself during prayer? And to which you, interestingly enough, you should reply this answer. Twitter. Um, Thousands of people send messages from the profane to the mundane to the profound uh, into the abyss of the internet little grains of sand onto a beach, you know, asking people for help, bringing people together, asking about certain causes, organizing people, um, as it has in many of the revolutions that we see in the Middle East over the past number of years. All sending out these tiny messages, hoping that, that someone will hear them. And so our world knows what prayer is very well. Um, But the problem is who they are asking. Now, the the point of Luke's parable is not to show us that even if God doesn't care about us, at least he'll answer our prayers to get us off his back. It's that even if the unjust judge responds in this manner, then, then how much more will the just judge do so? And Jesus is teaching us not only to be constant in prayer and petition, but who to be constant to. Who are you addressing? Who are you asking for these things? And unto whose door will we knock, knock, knock? Now, I'd argue both individually in our personal lives and then some more in our collective lives in our communities and our nations. One, one of the bigger problems that we, that we face is often we ask for the right things from the wrong people. Picture, if you will, that the widow, you know, finally got her justice. She got her case and the nobility of her pursuit after all her badgering. And then she had wondered why she had not been reconciled to that judge. Because his heart at the end of the day isn't changed. He still doesn't care about God, doesn't care about people, any, anything of the kind. She would have been expecting it from the wrong person. And often in our 
personal lives, we, we search for validation of our gifts, the feeling that we're valuable, and we seek these things from all the wrong sources. I've uh, taken a retail job at Indigo downtown, and it's um, amazing to me how many people you could see who go there not to buy anything. They're there for the feel, for the atmosphere, for the community. They're hoping to get things from this store that they are severely lacking in their own lives. And in fact, these, these stores and brands and whatnot have taken the place of communities and churches in people's lives. Retail stores, they want to sell you a product, but you go there for the music that's playing, the display, you know, I think Indigo's motto, which I should know, but I don't, is um, discover, inspire, and explore, or, or something like that. Um, and, and stores, they will desperately try to make you believe that they really can provide those things because they, they know at the end of the day that uh, that's where it can lure people into buying particular products. You know, you become wasteful in your money, and... You become vain in the products that are are sold, and emotions become aftertastes of purchases, all because uh, you're looking for its community, the solace from all the wrong people. Now, thinking more politically and widely, often at the dinner table. My, my mother, who, who keeps up uh, with, with Middle East stuff a lot, will often bring this up, and this kind of weighs on her heart. And particularly with a parable like this, I, I think it would be remiss if I didn't talk about such situations. There, there are many countries in the world that desire what we have. They want our economy, they want our society, they want our values, and they want um, our education because they want better for their children. And so they will desperately cry out to these other nations for help. They, They will cry out to the United States, they will cry out to Canada, they will cry out to Western Europe to receive these things, to make their lives better. And as much as we can help, one of the things that we think we can provide, and I think we're tricked into believe that we can provide, is that we can save these people from themselves. And furthermore, we may not be the, the best people to ask justice from. In many cases, we're the ones that flooded their land with weapons that have killed their children. And because a nation's first priority is always going to be itself, it it won't help any other nation unless it can see where its own benefit will lie. So one of the temptations that we're constantly drawn to is to believe ourselves to be saviors of the world. And this isn't so. Markets are not families, and nations are not saviors. That's why we need to go to God and knock, knock, knock. Now the widow's constant knocking and her as a positive example for us to follow is a reminder that as Christians, that as Christians it is perfectly right to look upon the world and say someone else is running this show. The God of this world is running this show. And to reject that reign and to rebel against that order, the groaning that we hear in all of creation for justice, that is perfectly right and true thing for us as saints to do. Over the summer, me and my flatmate Ryan, who I talked about a bit earlier, we read uh, together a Russian novel called The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. 
And if you have the time to read a 950-page Russian novel, I encourage you to pick this one. Um, it, it is, it is uh, absolutely incredible. And if you ever hear me complain about fiction, remind me that I referred this novel in my sermon, just to humble me a little bit. But one of the characters in that novel, a guy named uh, Ivan, uh, says to his saintly brother, Alyosha, it isn't God I don't accept, you see. It's the world created by him. The world of God I don't accept, and I cannot agree to accept. His, his entire argument about evil, he says at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's not about God's existence or whatnot, but if I have, if I have to believe that, that the way the, thing, the world is, is the result of the divine being, then I will hand my ticket back to him. Uh, I don't want that God, and it's actually the world that I have a problem with and I want to see changed. And I think the, the only difference between Ivan's view on this and what our view as Christians should be on this is not that we're rebelling against the world that God has made, but what, it, but what has become of it. And I often wonder how many atheists like Ivan we would have kneeling and praying beside us if they would feel that belief in God did not mean they had to accept the way that the world is and to accept the evil in it. But to recognize the fact, as the the Apostle Paul put it with the Holy Spirit, himself intercedes for us through wordless groans as we knock, knock, knock. Now, the prayer of petition to our God, as opposed to the unjust judge or all the idols that we seek after in moments of frustration, even as, as violent as the, as the Psalms, are made with a, a legitimate inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it quite literally galvanizes us into changing the course of history with our God. There are many sections of the Hebrew Bible, which I I can't get into you with, but there are many times when God is calling upon his people to pray to change the course of action. And there are many times when figures will pray, and the course of what God was going to do will change. People will repent. God will relent. His wrath. We can be literal participants with God in the way that history unfolds. And it's not that God needs us to do that. Could solve all the world's problems in one huge sweep. But desires us to participate with him. To desire him. And in, in, in this, we are reminded of our role And it is here where petitionary prayer could hopefully bring some mode of solace by by clarity, even though it it may cause us to reflect upon much of the tragedy in our world that we'd rather not think about. It is a reminder that our role is as participants, not as either Alpha or Omega. In the same way that often our problem is asking for the right things from the wrong people, sometimes our problem is that we quit asking or that we don't ask. We grow impatient. If the widow had given up on her patience with the judge, she would have attacked him as he feared. And it's it's this kind of scenario that we have in the first century. Why did the Romans come to destroy the temple? Well, why was Jesus saying, you know, wait, wait upon God, don't bring it about yourselves, because when you try to have brought about that freedom for your land by yourselves, you got squashed. Now, in our own personal lives, we often want validation or respect from certain people. And we will try desperately hard to make them fall in love with us. Um, To 
get them to, to, to see what we see and to respect us the way that we wish to be. And if we don't receive it from them, what we end up doing is we humiliate the person from whom we were asking these things through laughter or insult or we'll try to get someone else to mess with them just so that we can get that by force what we were not able to get through persuasion and asking. And I can tell you in particular, in, in the, the world of young adults in, in, our, in our city, one of the growing things that we'll have to confront more and more, um, I'm speaking to a particular issue now, is there are quite a deal of young men in our society that believe that they are entitled to the affections and the attention of women. And when they don't receive that, they will harass, they will manipulate, and they will rape. And it will be taken as normative, as no big deal. These men are cowardice and they're violent and they have forgotten their God. And they have sought things out of feeling that they were entitled to what they were not. In the epistle of James, we read this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Unfortunately, that last little bit is another aspect which hopefully you will discuss among yourselves after, which is about asking with the right motives for certain things, which unfortunately I I can't get much into. But the reason that I have highlighted the Greek word here for wars, polemoi, it's where we get our English word polemics, is because it doesn't refer just to bitter backbiting, which the word for quarrels does, but it refers quite literally to wars. So speaking now, again, collectively and nationwide about how people grow impatient and will take by force what they could not get by prayer or petition. We have Vladimir Putin in Russia that wants to restore the glory of the Soviet Union and he won't get it. So he will take Crimea and he will probably take the Ukraine and whatever else he can get his hands on. We have ISIS that similarly wants to restore their glory of the Islamic Ottoman Empire and they won't be received it because of foreign intervention and their own wars between the Sunnis and Shias and elsewhere. So they will take whatever they can get their hands on to retrieve it, and they won't stop spreading. The United States, including its allies, which is us, Canada, we're we're desperately trying to (laughs) retain our glory as beacons of democracy in the world. And as people sort of don't believe that anymore, the less and less that they believe in that, the more built up military, intelligence, police, will be brought about to enforce that order by force because they couldn't get it through, through persuasion or prayer. All of this because they and we have not had the solace and the peace to remember that we are not Alpha and Omega and have given up or refused to knock, knock, knock. So far, this has been a pretty heavy sermon, and I'm delighted to tell you that it will end very heavily as well. So, sorry sorry about that. Um, What do we do, however, if the door isn't opened? We're asking the right person. We're asking for the right things. We're asking with the right motives. And nothing comes about. It it is here where I'd like to leave you with a a very profound clip from a a really amazing movie called God on Trial. And I got to see this as a play. And I I 
recommend that you all see it. It's, it's, it's amazing. And the, the film takes place uh, around the bunker of Jews in World War II that decide to put their God on trial for breaking the covenant to their people. Because the Jewish people's existence was now in question. So God is, is God guilty of breaking his covenant to them? Has he failed in his responsibilities? And they come to the answer that God is guilty for that. They, the last person to turn is, is the rabbi. And at the end, one of the more skeptical young men asks the rabbi, now that God is guilty, now that God has heard, has not heard, has not heard our prayers, what do we do? And the, well, the rabbi will, will respond in, in this clip. And at the end of this clip, the worship team will, will come up and lead us in, in a closing song of petition. Uh, I thank you for your attentive ears. And if you have pushback, I enjoy that much more than passive complacency. So please talk to me. I love it. Um, yeah, so this is, this is the rabbi's response to the young man's question of, now that God is guilty and he hasn't heard our prayers, what do we do now?